Father God, we do come before you tonight, Lord, and I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, that we have your word in front of us, that we can study, that we can know you better, that, Lord, we can know, God, what you desire for our lives, that, God, you are in control and you guide and direct, and I thank you so much that we can have that assurance that you are in control, Lord, and that you have our lives in your hand. And I just praise you that we can have that confidence. And Lord, as we open your word tonight, I pray that you would open it to us, Lord, that you would just reveal your will and your words to us. And so, Father, we just want to give this time to you and pray that you will be glorified in it, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So I can say we're, it's kind of where we're at in School of Ministry, going through the Old Testament survey and, and looking at this last week, looked at the Chronicles and Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is kind of one of my Bible heroes. He's one that, uh, that I've always just, when I grow up, I want to be like Nehemiah. You know, of someone with great faith, someone who, who doesn't let distractions come in and distract, that distract from what God is wanting to do in his life. And, and so just looking at that, you know, and I was talking, you know, last night as I, as you go through and hopefully you're reading through your Bible in a year and you're, you're getting the word of God in you, but it's always amazing to me when I, when I do that is that you just realize that no matter what the stage of life is, what the timetable is in life, what, what is going on in, in our country or in the world, that God always is in control. And that God always has his remnant or he always has people in place to make sure to get his will done. That God is not surprised by anything. God is not... Uh, wondering what's going to happen, that he knows the end from the beginning and that we can rest assured that our God has things under control. And the more that I study the word and the more that I ingest that and get it in me, the more that I realize that, that I don't have to fear things, that I don't have to get wrapped up in, in things that are going on because I know that God is in control. And that doesn't mean that we are not concerned about things or whatever, but but we can walk in assurance that God's will and God's plan is going to be uh, implemented, that God is going to do what God's going to do in spite of what the enemy tries to bring about our way or bring about in, in the world, that God wins. And that's, you know, so comforting to know in, in trying times, in difficult times, and also in the good times, that we know that that is because God is in control. And so as we, as we start off with, with Nehemiah, just kind of a little background, obviously, of looking at, at where the nation of Israel is at this point in time. It's after they have been deported, after Nebuchadnezzar has come in and took, taken them to Babylon, and now the 70 years has been up, and, uh, they went back with Zerubbabel. He built the temple. And then Ezra came in, a spiritual leader. And now we're seeing that, that though the temple was built and though they were back in the land, the ones that, that had went back, obviously, were, was there, but yet the job wasn't completed. And there was still more work to be done. There were still things that needed to be taken care of. And so we... We find that here that, that God has raised up this man, Nehemiah, to go and, and finish the work that God started back when he brought them back into the land as he had promised to do. And we see throughout Scripture as we look at that, that God's promises are always fulfilled. He fulfilled the promise to the nation that if you are unfaithful, and you go after other gods and you do these things that I will take you out of the land. But he also said that 
For 70 years, you're going to be gone. He, through Jeremiah, he prophesied, he told them that you're going to be out of the land for 70 years. And at that time, after that time, when you seek me, I will restore you back into the land. And that's where we see that that, that has taken place. And the temple has been, again, rebuilt. And, and we see that through that, that there was conflict. There's always, see, when we're doing the will of God, there's always going to be conflict come our way. And that's just how it is. But God always wins. And so we can rest assured in that as well. So we, we pick it up here with Nehemiah, and it says, the, word, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had, re, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. So we see here that we get just a little bit of Nehemiah. The 20th year here would have been the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon, the king there. And, and so he's, here's a guy, Nehemiah, that would have never been to Judah, to, to Jerusalem. He was born in captivity. He was one that was born in captivity. But yet we see here, and we'll see as we go further in this, what a heart he had for God and what a heart he had for God's people and for, this, for God's city, for Jerusalem, for that area, that these, his brethren came and he asked, you know, what's going on there in, in Jerusalem? What is happening? How, how are they faring? Those that have went back, those that, I like that, that survived that, that escaped the captivity, that survived the captivity, how are they doing now that they're, that they're back in the land? How's things going for them? And the report he got was not the report that he wanted, obviously. And we'll, we see that when he said, And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. That he's going, they're there. But it's not good that they are in great distress that they they're under great reproach that they're not experiencing that peace that God wants them to there in that land that that the walls are broke down they have no defense that they have no way to protect themselves and and they're they're being oppressed by those that are around and and so Nehemiah was hoping that he would say, hey man, things are great, things are good. But that wasn't the case. And even though, again, God had brought them back into the land and God had placed them back there, still there was trials, there was hardships, there were tribulations that they were going through. And, you know, as we walk in our Christian walk, as we walk with the Lord, we find that that's going to be the case that there's going to be those trials and tribulations and those things that come our way, even though we're in where God wants us to be, yet still those things are going to affect us and those things are going to come into our lives. And he goes there, you know, things are still not completed, if you will. There's still that work that needs to be done. So it was... In, in verse 4, so it was, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. That's the part of Nehemiah th that I want to be. You know, we Pastor Pat talked about this last weekend of, you know, of brotherly love and, and having a heart for those that, that are being persecuted, those that, you know, of having heart, a heart for those. And, and here we see this man, Nehemiah, was that guy. I'm sure that he didn't necessarily know most of the people or any of them that are there, but he had a heart for God's people. He had a heart for God's uh, city. He had a heart for God that 
And what did he do? He sat down and he wept and he mourned. But more than that, he prayed. We see that, that Nehemiah, the thing that impresses me about him, that he was certainly a man of prayer, a man who sought the Lord in these things, and that he, he cried out to the Lord for, you know, to interceding for the nation of Israel, for the people that were there. And he was crying out to the Lord, and he was mourning, and he was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And that he went to the Lord in prayer, he was fasting, going, you know, and, and we'll see. I believe that he was, he was asking here, God, how can I be a part of the solution? How can I help? What can I do? And, and we see here that, that he, he was also a man of the word. Nehemiah obviously knew God's word. He was obviously raised in a family that taught him the scripture, that he knew God's word because we'll see in this prayer that he prays that he knew God's word. And, and we'll, let's, let's look at that prayer. And I'm going to read through this, this whole prayer here from, from 6 through the end of the chapter. And then we'll go back and talk about that. But he was a man of prayer. He was a man of the word. He, had, he was a man that had a heart for the Lord, that he sought the Lord. And so he said, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corrupt against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the words that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out of, to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. We see here that Nehemiah knew God's promises. He knew God's mercy, but he knew that God had put them, and he's, I, I love this prayer because he's not saying that, God, I don't know why this is happening. God, why is all these things? No, he said, I know exactly why these is, things are happening because we have brought it on ourselves, that we have acted corruptly, we were unfaithful, we, they served other gods, they went after other gods, and he didn't say they did that. He said, we did that. My father's house and I, that I, he come to the Lord humbly and he come to the Lord praying back, reminding God, if you will, like God needs reminded. But it's always good to pray back God's promises and to pray his word. Because I know when I'm doing that, I'm praying God's will. That, that I can be assured that God is hearing that. But listen, to, he says, you know, a couple of times, God, please. Hear me. Open your eyes. Let me, let me bring this before you, that I pray before you day and night for, the, for your children. And he reminds God, these are your servants. God, these are your people. God, these belong to you. And so, God, I'm bringing them before you. 
And I understand, Lord, that we have been unfaithful and you promised that if we were, that you would scatter them among the nations. But God, you also promised that you would gather them back and that you would bring them. And, and he sees that, that God is a God that keeps his commandments, that God keeps his, his promises. And God had brought them back into the land and God had brought them back to a place where they, where they worshiped. And I, yeah, I love when they went back into the land that they built an altar and they sacrificed to the Lord and they, and they built the temple. And we, we know that rebuilding the temple, again, as, as the rebel started that and laid the foundations that, that there was problems within and without. That some of the older guys said, you know, this is not the glory that was before and it says that there was such weeping with them and celebration with the other that it was hard to tell the difference. But God encouraged them, even at the point where they were commanded to stop building the temple, that then God brought it about and they finished the temple, but they never, again, finished that, that work of building the wall and, and finishing that, that wall so that they would be secure, where they would have that that security and they would have that protection that that, that would afford them. And so he said, God, your, your people are still living in reproach. And the nations are looking at them and, and saying, is God going to finish this? Where's their God? Where, you know, type of thing that they were, he said, God, this is really <laughs> kind of your problem, God. I'm bringing this before you and but he says, I like that, that it's, Lord, we, we're in this position, not because you are being a mean and hard God. We're in this position because of sin, because we have sinned against you, because, Lord, you're giving us what we deserve. But, Lord, remember your mercy. Have mercy on us and you know, that, that as you promised, we've seen that you would cast us out and you did that, but now we see that you're bringing us back. And so, the, and I like that, with your strong hand, that you redeemed, you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. That none of this was done in their own power. None of this was done in their own, with their own will. But God had brought them back. God had caused them to be able to do what what had been done. And Nehemiah's heart was, I just want to see God's city restored. I want to see God's people restored. I want to see them in a place where they were before. And so we see here that, you know, he talks about their, Lord, grant me mercy in the sight of this man. This man was the king. Because he, then he goes and says, I was the cupbearer. I was the cupbearer for the king. And that's where I say that, you know, as we looked at the book of Esther, what did Mordecai tell Queen Esther? That maybe you were raised up for such a time as this. Well, Nehemiah was being raised up for such a time as this. Ezra, Zerubbabel, and back through history, God had raised people up to do the will, to do his will, to do what needed to be done, that there was always someone there that God was raising up. And, and I love the fact that Nehemiah was, was really nobody in the world side other than, I mean, yeah, he was somebody with the king, but what did God do? God put him in a position where he had an audience with the king, where he had a voice with the king for one that could help and do something about what was going on in Jerusalem. Just as he had put Queen Esther in that position where she had an audience with the king. Just God always will use those who are available. And just as Mordecai told Esther, you need to be available. Go put yourself out and see what God does. And I believe that's what Nehemiah was saying here as well. God, I, I'm, I'm available. I'm I'm ready to do whatever you call me to do. Give me mercy within, with this king. Let me have mercy before him. 
because God, you've put me in this position. You know, and, and we look at things when people, when, when King Cyrus gave the decree that they could go back and build the temple. And they were, we have the list of, of those that went back, and I know you all love to read that and, and do the numbers, and that, that's really a, but we see that, you know, there's a lot of prominent people that didn't go back. Daniel never went back. And they're, you know, and, and read some people going, you know, why was Nehemiah still there? You know, and it's kind of interesting with Nehemiah, too, being a cupbearer, being there in the palace, being there uh, a, a high position in that, just as, as Daniel was as well, you know, and had influence over those pagan kings, had influence with them. But, you know, Nehemiah was, was there and, and had that audience with the king. And he had it pretty cushy, if you would. That would have been probably a pretty good pretty cushy job as long as nobody was trying to kill the king being the cup bearer, yeah, that that could get a little dicey but uh, but yet he was living there in the palace in in that luxury in that area but yet he had a heart for those that were that were being persecuted for those that were being mistreated those that were being was looking at it reproach that he had a heart for those people even though he himself was there living in that in the palace and again probably had a pretty and we see that that he obviously was a man of integrity as we're going to see that he was a man that was busy about doing the will of the king because he had a very good relationship obviously with the king and, and let's, let's read on here in, in chapter 2. And it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. And now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad? What's the matter with your face, Nehemiah? Since you are not sick... This is nothing but sorrow of heart. And I love Nehemiah here. So I became dreadfully afraid that he's gone. He may just off me here. That, again, Nehemiah had prayed. Nehemiah had sought the Lord. He had asked God for his guidance. He had asked God to give him favor with the king. But yet there was that element of fear when he stepped out and, and was in front of the king. And I think that's okay. Because I believe when God calls us to do something, that there's always an element of fear. At least there are with me, I don't know. That there's always that element of, of God, is this really, <laughs> how's this going to work out, God? Is this going to be okay? And I've never been before the king where, you know, they're going to kill me. You may after the service, but I, but listen, that he was afraid. And what did he do? He prayed. He sought the Lord. That when he, when that fear and when things come upon him, his first reaction was prayer, which tells me he was a man of prayer because that is, I got to admit, that's not my first reaction normally I have to pray and repent usually after those things <laughs> but if I would just you know and my wife is so good at that and I've told you before because I will be doing things and I'll be upset and I and she goes did you pray about it no I wouldn't be this way if I had so you pray I'll go no but we need to be people of prayer that, that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He was a man of the word. He was a man who sought the Lord. And so we see that in many instances, his first reaction to things was prayer, that he sought the Lord. And it was a very, you know, I mean, it was, a, it's not, we don't have the longest prayer we have there is in, in chapter one. It's usually just those little, you know, kind of the Peter prayer of Lord help. 
of, man, I, I, God, direct this path right now. And he said, you know, that no matter how he tried, I'm sure he even tried to hide that when he went before the king, but the king saw because he knew Nehemiah. They were close. And he said, I've never seen you like this before, Nehemiah. What is going on? What? Why are you so downcast? Why? This is nothing but sorrow of the heart. I can see that something is breaking your heart. Something is really bothering you. What's going on? And so he said to the king, may the king live forever. That's a good thing for a cupbearer to say, right? <laughs> I, I hope, you, hope you make it, king. And especially, I'd kind of like to butter you up here a little bit. King, live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Why, why would I not be distressed? Why would I not be sad when this is going on with my father's tombs, with my people? Why, why would I not be distressed? Why would I not be sad when I heard this news? Why would I, why would I not? And then the king said to me, what do you request? What do you want, Nehemiah? What, what is it? And that's where he goes. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah, what do you, what do you want? What's your request? Tell me what you want. And so what did he do? He prayed. Lord, give me the words. I'm sure he's going, okay, God, give me favor again. Give me the words. Give me clarity of thought so that I can talk to the king about what's going on. And so, and, and so I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it, that I may rebuild it. King, if it pleases you, if I have found favor with you, then let it be that I can do this, that if it pleases you, King. And again, I believe by saying that and by looking at that, number one, the king obviously knew Nehemiah and knew his, that something is, is going on. And, and I like it that, that Nehemiah didn't demand things from the king, he didn't say, look, you, I serve the God of heaven and you need, to, no, he's going, hey, I know that you have the power. I know that you can do what you're going to do. But I request of you that if you, if I found favor with you, if I, Lord, King, let me, let me go that I may rebuild the city, that I may rebuild that wall that I might take care of that. Now, you would think the kings might look at him and say, you're going to go rebuild a wall. You're a cupbearer, Nehemiah. You're not construction. You're not, you know, and that's what I love about God is that he takes people with no skill and uses them to accomplish his, now, I don't know if he had skill or not in that, but... He was a cupbearer, so I, I kind of doubt that he was much into construction. But God uses those people that we wouldn't look at to use, and why? And we'll see throughout this, the other thing that I love about Nehemiah is that he never takes credit for the things that God did. That he give God the glory throughout the building, throughout those things, that it was never look what Nehemiah has done. It's look what the God of heaven, look what the God of Israel has done. That he never took the credit for what God was doing. He never took it to himself. That he humbly went before there and saw and realized that, that it wasn't about him, that it was about God. But the other thing I love about Nehemiah, as, as he fasted, and he prayed, and he sought the Lord, he was confident in the calling that God had put on his life to do this. 
that God had made that very clear, that Nehemiah, you need to go and oversee this. You need to go and take care of this. I believe that God had put that calling on his life, and God had put that desire in his heart way before this because he was a man who sought the Lord. He was a man who was in God's word. He was a man that was in prayer, and he was a man that, that was confident. And again, that doesn't mean that he wasn't afraid are a little, you know, worried about some of that because it said that, you know, hey, I was dreadfully afraid to bring this up to the king, but I had to because it was a calling that God had put on my life that I knew that God had called me to do that very thing, though I wasn't equipped, though it wasn't something that, that, Normally, you would, you would think that he would do, but yet he knew because he sought the Lord in prayer, he sought the Lord in his word, and he knew that God had prepared him and had called him to do that very thing. And so even though there was fear, even though there was that, man, I, I hope this works out. If not, this could really go bad. Yet he st stepped out in faith and said, King, I want, if you would allow this, let me go and take care of that city. And then he said, Then the king said to me, the queen was sitting by beside him, How long will you, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased, hello? So, so it pleased the king to, to send me, and I set a time. I like that, that, you know, he, he doesn't even go into the details. He doesn't go, well, okay, king, I'm going to be, you know, I'm sure he did to the king, but this is information we didn't need, that I need to leave on this date, I'm going to be gone this long, I'll be back, I'll do this. But, you know, and you see that a lot in Nehemiah, that he just kind of, skips over some of that stuff and just said, but you see, he had a plan already. He knew what he needed to do. He already had that in his heart that God had revealed, okay, this is when, this is how long you're going to be. So he said, okay. So I set, set him a time. And furthermore, I said to the king, one more thing. If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they may permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the king, or the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city walls and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Listen, he didn't say the king granted me this stuff because of the benevolence of the king or because I was such a good employee to the king or because the king's such a good guy. What did he say? The king granted me this stuff because God moved on his heart to grant me this stuff. That, and I, I like that he, he had the, the guts to say, hey, king, I need, I want to make sure that you give me a letter that, that I go safely and that when I get there, I want you to finance this. I, want, I need the timber. I need the stuff to rebuild the wall. I need you. And it's interesting when you read Ezra, when Ezra was going back, he, would, he had went and he was said, man, I'd like, I'd like a police escort here if I could get it, but... I'm afraid to ask the king because I had told him that God's going to take care of me. And so he went without that. But yet Nehemiah said, I need, I need protection. And see, we see that, that then the king not only gave him the letters, but that sent the army with him to make sure he got there, to make sure that he got to take care of the things that needed to be taken care of. And so we see the difference, you know, between Ezra and Nehemiah there, and which one was right? Both. 
There was nothing wrong with what either one of them did because God works differently in different people. And God doesn't always do what we think, you know, would have God taken care of Nehemiah? I, I believe absolutely he would have. But guess what? God took care of Nehemiah by giving him the letters and giving him those people. And it, it, there's nothing wrong with, with either one of what they did there. And so we see that, that because of that, that he obviously went there and he says there as he, as he goes on, because of the good hand of my God was upon me, then I went to the governor in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. And when Sambalat, the, the uh, Heronite, and Tobias, the Ammonite officials heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. And so here we see the persecution is going to begin that these guys that were in the region that had, was running the show there, if you will, that has, was bringing reproach and was bringing the trouble up on the people of Israel, they weren't happy that Nehemiah showed up. And they weren't happy that he had letters from the king, and they weren't happy that he had this army with him. Because they're going, he's going to tell you, if this happens, it's going to take our power. We're not going to have power over these people anymore. The thing I love about looking at Nehemiah, looking at Ezra, looking at those, that the, the thing that I see anyway is number one, the enemy's not happy when we step out in faith and when we are serving the Lord, when we're busy about doing the things of God, that the enemy's not happy and that the enemy is going to come against us. But the thing that I love is the enemy never wins because God is in control. That they, they try everything to discourage the building of this wall. They tried everything to discourage what God had set in motion, but they were defeated not because of Nehemiah being such a great guy. It's because Nehemiah has a great God. And so listen, I can tell you, when persecution comes your way, when things are coming against you, God will win. That when we give those problems to the Lord, when we follow him, when we seek him, he's going to take care of those things. He will never fail. He is always faithful. He will always win. And I love the humbleness of, of Nehemiah as he, as he comes into the city. That he doesn't come in and go, I'm Nehemiah. I'm from the government. I'm here to help. No, he went in humbly. He went in just, and did, it said for three days, he didn't say anything to anybody about what God had laid on his heart. That he went in, and even by night, he went and surveyed the wall. That he went and looked at what was going on and what it was going to entail. And then he goes back to the people and says, here's what God has, has in mind. We need to build this wall. And here's the plan. You know, we need to gather together and we need to build this wall. And time's not going to allow us to go through a lot of that, but the thing that I want us to look at is the first thing that these guys did was start to ridicule them, was start to make fun of them. You're really going to look at the rubble, look at the mess. You're really going to do this? You guys, you're dreamers. It's never going to happen. And so, you know, and I find that in our Christian walk. So often, we get excited about the things of God. We get excited about what God's doing in our lives. And those critics are going to come. And they're going to try 
to discourage you in your walk with the Lord. They're going to try to defeat you with their words. They're going to try to beat you down. And Nehemiah said, you know, he didn't let that affect him. He said, he told him, look, in verse 20 of chapter 2, he said, when they, when they come against him that way, so I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Hey, you're right. We can't do this. You are absolutely correct. We are not equipped to build this wall, but we've got a secret weapon. It's called the God of heaven. And God will prosper us. God is the one who's going to make this happen. He himself, God, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, his servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Get out of here and leave us alone. I am going to serve the Lord. I am going to follow through with what God has showed me and called me to do. You can ridicule me. You can make fun of us. But we are going to do what God has called us to do. And we see that he did. And when that didn't work, I mean, they kept, you know, making fun. Oh, if a fox gets on the wall, it's going to knock down. What are you guys? But when that didn't work, then they plotted to come. Okay, well, we'll just attack them. And we'll, we'll stop them that way. And I love what Nehemiah did. He goes, and I like to say it this way, Nehemiah is the poster child for trust in the Lord and keep your powder dry. <laughs> what did he do? He said, I'm trusting the Lord, but get your spears and your swords and we're going to be prepared if they come. And we're told that in that when they realized that God had exposed what they were going to do, that they got discouraged, Sam Ballot and the boys. They go, something's going on here. God is working, and now they know our plot, so it's not going to work. And, you know, and then we see that that, that turmoil from within came, and the people are going, look, we... We're building this wall. We're doing this. We, we mortgage things. How are we going to pay this? How are we going to do that? And Nehemiah took care of, of that. But uh, I want to get over here and look at, at uh, in chapter 4, in verse 14, as they're coming against him and they're, you know, again, he, he's prayed. He, he's seeking the Lord as these things come against him. But in in 14, he says, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Remember the Lord is on our side. Remember the Lord is going to see this through to completion. That don't be afraid of of what's coming against you from the outside, remember the Lord. And I challenge you tonight that I don't know what's going on in your life, but if those things are coming on, remember the Lord. Remember his promises. Be someone of the word as Nehemiah was, that was someone who stands on the word of God, who stands on the promises of God, that he who began a good work will see it through to completion. Stand on those promises that God has you in his hand and that God will take care of you no matter what. That God is the one who is in control of that. And, and we see that as he goes through all of that, as they, you know, again, we're going you know, to send letters to the king. You guys are doing this, you're doing that. And Nehemiah goes, knock yourself out. God has this. And then they tried, as the wall was completed... But he says the gates were not yet hung. They were still vulnerable. The guys decided, we'll attack him another way. Hey, Nehemiah, you need to come down to the valley of Ono. Oh, that should give you an idea right there. <laughs> oh, no, don't go down there. Don't do that. And we need to have a conference. We need to talk about what's going on. We, and I love Nehemiah's going, guys, I am busy. 
I don't have time to come and mess with you guys. I have a great work to do here. Leave me alone. Leave us alone. We are not. And it says they, they tried five times, kept sending people. You need to come down here every time. I am busy. Leave me alone. We have a work to do. The enemy will never give up, but the enemy will never win. He will continue to try to distract us in our walk no matter what. But yet when we keep our eyes, when we remember the Lord, when we keep our eyes on the Lord, we will be victorious in whatever he's called us to do. And so we need to be, the thing that I get from Nehemiah here is a couple of things. Is Number one, we need to be people of prayer. We need to be people that are seeking the Lord in prayer. We need to be people of the word. We need to know God's word. We need to know God's promises. We need to know what God wants and what God has because when we do and we're praying and we're seeking the Lord, then we're going to have the courage to step out and do what God's called us to do no matter what that is, no matter how scary that is, no matter what's going on, that God, and God is going to reveal himself to us through his word, through prayer. He's going to give us that assurance of what he wants us to do as we seek him in his word. And so over in, kind of wrapping this up in, in chapter 6, at verse 15, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of Ula. In 52 days... The wall was finished. The job was done for that part of it. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. I love that. Again, Nehemiah didn't say, Man, I come in and I rallied the troops and I kept them on task and I did. He's going, no. When they saw that this was done, it was done because of our God. And God uses us in areas that people will see that wasn't them. That was their God. That never in any of this did Nehemiah take glory for what God was doing. And I think that's the other thing that, that really stands out and I think that we really need, don't take God's glory. Give the glory to God. See the victory that God wants to do and that the nations around would see, man, I don't know, that, <laughs> that bunch of Calvary Chapel couldn't do that. But man, they have a great God. And God will see it through to completion. That God is at work. And that God will see us through. And so tonight, maybe where you're at, that maybe you're a little discouraged in your walk. Maybe things have not gone the way that you feel like they should have gone. Remember the Lord. Go to Him in prayer. Get in the Word. And let God bring about the victory in our lives. Let's stand up and pray. Lord God, I thank you for examples like Nehemiah who stayed steadfast throughout his turmoil, throughout the things that came against him and through all of that, Lord, that he, Father, stayed right where you wanted him to do. And Lord, that through him seeking you, that God, he didn't get distracted from the task that was at hand. But Lord, that he trusted you, that you would see it through. And so Lord, I pray for each one of us that's here tonight, that Lord, if there's things going on in our lives, that, that Lord, we need to surrender to you, that we would do that. And Father, that we would let you defeat the enemies in our lives. Those doubts, those fears. Lord, those 
real trouble things, things that come in our way, Lord, whether it's health or finances or whatever the case may be, Lord, that you're bigger than those things. So, Father, let us walk in the truth that, God, you are a God that keeps his promises, that, God, you are a God that will see it through to completion and that you would get the glory and that, Lord, you would be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.